A lot of people think that Christians are, are really negative when it comes to, to sex. All our message is don't do it. It's actually exactly the opposite. It's that we recognize its power and its beauty, its potential for good, its potential for harm, and how it's supposed to be a part of a complete fusion of our lives. You know, what you think about marriage affects the way that you view so much more of life. At the end of the day, topics like dating, conflict, and even, even singleness are ultimately filtered through the lens of marriage. Wait, you say, so even if I'm single, my singleness is actually shaped by my thoughts on marriage? I know that doesn't seem possible, but I am here to tell you today that that is 100% true. Today, we're gonna to talk about how the gospel message shapes the essence and the purpose of marriage and teaches us why, no matter what you've been called to, whether marriage or singleness, you're going to need God's help in order to accomplish it. So like we're gonna do every single day here on this program, I want you to grab your Bible and let's see what God has to say about this important topic. I think it'll be an encouragement to you. Let me state the obvious, okay? Uh, the obvious is that romance and marriage have great potential for good in your life. It really is one of God's greatest gifts to us, but the flip side of that is because it has great potential for good, it also has great potential for harm. I mean, just think about it. Ask most people, for most of you, if you were to recount your most painful memory, chances are it's gonna have something to do with, with some kind of, of heartbreak in, 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 in romance or in family. If you ask somebody to tell you about their greatest mistake that they've made, it's almost always related to something, uh, something sexual. When people come into my, into my office and they sit down and they say, Pastor, I've, I've never told anybody this and I've got to tell you this. It almost always is almost always going to be related to sex. And in some ways, um, I've heard it said you could think of sex and um, romance. You could think of it like, um, like, a, like a gun, like a pistol. When my dad taught me how to use um, a gun, the first thing he taught me to do was respect it. Uh, he said the worst thing uh, is somebody grabbing a, a pistol and waving it around with no idea of what it can do. My dad would tell me, he said, never point that at something that you don't intend to shoot. Well, the same thing is true for, for romance. If you don't respect it, if you don't understand its power, then it could do you and it can do other people great harm. Um, this, this Bible, this Bible that we open every single weekend. This is the recounting of God's intentions, his design for sexuality, his design for marriage, his design for romance. It explains what it is, what it's for, and how it's supposed to work. Um, after I got married, Danny Aiken, who is a president over at Southeastern Seminary and um, a friend and, and in many ways a mentor of mine, he told Veronica and I, um, he, we were sitting there having dinner with him, and he said, listen, there are two things, there are two things that you need to understand to have a happy marriage. He said the first one is that God is the author of all of it, and his word instructs you on the best way that you can set it up. He said if you want to have a happy marriage, if you want to have a fulfilling uh, romantic life, a happy family, you need to follow God's counsel as carefully as you can. He said the second thing you need to understand is that, is that when it comes to marriage, men are a lot like dogs and, and women are a lot like cats. I, Veronica and I kind of looked at him sort of quizzically and he was like, yeah, men are like dogs. He looked at my wife and he said, how do you make a dog happy? Three things. So you will make a dog happy, you feed it, you praise it, and you play with it. He said, if you, wanna, if you want to make JD happy, he said, that should be your guide. He said, how are women like cats? And I said, he said, well, how do you make a cat happy? He said, nobody really knows. But whatever you did the first time, probably is not gonna work the second time. So that's gonna be your assignment as you go through this. Um, this series is gonna be more about Danny Aiken's first piece of counsel about what God's word says about marriage and romance and family and, and less about the second. But it's gonna be great, I think. Matthew chapter 19 is where we are going to be. Um, we're calling this series Forever Family. And the idea comes from an answer that Jesus gave to a, a controversial question that he was asked there in Matthew 19. And the answer that Jesus gives, he introduces a, a new outlook on marriage. At least I would say that it's gonna be new for most of us. Uh, a new outlook on marriage that will reshape how we think about everything connected to marriage. Uh, connected to um, divorce is gonna be the question that he, he talks about, singleness, sex, conflict, and, and many other things. You might be sitting there and you might be saying, well, I'm not married and I don't think I'm gonna be married anytime in the near future, so what's, gonna, what's this gonna have for me? Ironically, this series might be the most helpful for you because you see, understanding God's purposes for marriage 
will help you understand how he fulfills those same purposes in your life in other ways when, when you're not married. Matthew 19, Jesus is hosting a, a live version of his own Ask Me Anything podcast. And the Pharisees, verse three, came up to him and they tested him. They said, is it lawful, Jesus, to divorce one's wife for any cause? Jesus answered, he said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them both male and female? And he said, now quoting from Genesis 2, the opening chapters of the Bible, he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the two in that marriage are going to become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has therefore joined together, no man should separate. Now, before we get into Jesus's answer to the divorce question, let's just consider this. What is Jesus teaching us about marriage with this quotation and with his application of it? Because his thoughts about marriage are gonna shape his, his answer to divorce and also gonna teach us how to think about a lot of other things that are connected to marriage also. Now, here's what he's teaching us. Number one, he's showing us that the essence of marriage is covenant. That word cleave that Jesus cites there in Genesis 2, um, in verse, uh, from Genesis 2 and verse 5, that word cleave in Hebrew literally means to make covenant. The essence of a marriage is covenant. Marriage, in a technical sense, is your public vow of faithfulness. Without that vow, you're not married. Having intensely loving feelings or affections for somebody doesn't make you married. I mean, for, for many of you, nobody seems to be more excited about you every day than your dog. When it comes to affection or loving feelings, your dog has those feelings, but that, dog, that doesn't make you married to the dog. In fact, when you think about it, the marriage ceremony is less about the state of your feelings in the present, and the marriage is more about your promise to love in the future. You are covenanting to be tender to be faithful, to be kind and compassionate and affectionate and patient from that point on. Um, when I've done weddings, um, a lot of times the couple will ask if they can write their own vows. And that's great, and I always say yes. But I always ask them if I can see their vows before they actually give them in the ceremony. Because a lot of times the vows that they write end up being a lot about how much they love each other now. Oh, you're awesome, and you just smell like rainbows and sunshine or whatever. But that's not really what a marriage covenant is about. Those things are sweet, yes, but the covenant is not about your feelings in the present. The covenant is about your promise for the future. Marriage is also not just an efficient system that God creates to, to propagate the human species or to, or, or, or to anchor society. Rapid, rap, rabbits and rats are great at rapid propagation of their species, but they don't get married. Marriage is a union, Jesus says, in which God fuses two lives into one. You see verse six, what God has joined together right? Nobody should separate. In a marriage covenant, your lives are intertwined in such a way that everything about you becomes one. Your future families become one. Your future happiness and successes become one. Your bank accounts become one. Your emotional lives become one. All that culminates in sex where physically your bodies become one. And see, that's going to have massive implications for how you think about divorce, Jesus says, and we'll get to that in a minute. But it's also got massive implications for how we think about sex, which we're gonna to get to later in this series. You see, if God designed marriage as a total fusion of souls, then when you separate physical oneness, sex, from oneness in every other area, that's going to tear you apart at a fundamental level. You know, what makes a zombie creepy is that it's a body without a soul. Well, that and the fact that it wants to eat you, of course. But, but what, what makes a zombie a zombie is you got a, you've got a working body without a soul in there. Sex apart from marriage separates the body from all the other dimensions of the soul. And somebody says, but I really, really love this person. Yeah, I, I get that. But you and I both know that without that covenant, you could walk away from it at any moment. The creator's design for sex from the beginning is that it was to be experienced in a relationship in which that physical oneness is coupled by oneness in every other area. Again, we're gonna get more to that later, but let me just say this right now, okay? A lot of people think that Christians are, are really negative when it comes to, to sex. All our message is don't do it, don't talk about it. I, I would, I'm gonna explain this to you later. It's actually exactly the opposite. It's that we recognize its power and its beauty, its potential for good, its potential for harm, and how it's supposed to be a part of a complete fusion of our lives. Um, that's number one, is that the essence of marriage is covenant. And the second thing Jesus teaches us is that the purpose for marriage is friendship. Now hear me out here, okay? Because I understand there are a lot of purposes for marriage, 
But when you look at Genesis 2 that Jesus is quoting here, the immediate cause that he points to is the reason that God created marriage was the need for companionship. You see there verse 5? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. What reason is he talking about? Well, you got to read the verse before that. The phrase before that is from the beginning, God made them male and female. God's creation of the female was in response to a problem. And that problem, Genesis 2.18, was that it was not good for man to be alone. So God says, I'm gonna make him a companion. About everything else that God had made, God said, it's good. But for the man in his alone state, that was the one thing in all of creation before the fall that God looked at it and said, not good. God makes this statement before the fall, before Adam sins. That ache of loneliness is the one ache that we have that does not arise from sin. Adam, I explained to you, had a perfect quiet time with God 24 hours a day. And yet still, even with a perfect quiet time and walking with God 24 hours a day, he still has an ache for human companionship. And that's because God created us in his image and God exists eternally as a trinity in community with his equals. So God creates for Adam a companion, his equal, just from the opposite gender. The word that God uses to describe the, the woman that he made, edzer konegdo, literally means alike but different. Somebody like Adam, somebody his equal, but also different, a different gender. In that way, their marriage would be like the Trinity. And it's same in the essence, in their essence the same, but in their person and roles different. The woman was created to be his companion, his equal, his friend. In fact, several times in the Old Testament, the marriage partner is called just that. In Hebrew, ahalup, which means a deep friend. By the way, I think I'm giving y'all some great nicknames for your boo, right? My, 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 my hot halloo, my little Ed Zare Connecto. That's better than sugar burger, I think. So if you want to impress her, you just call her your halloo. But all this is why I say that friendship or companionship is the purpose of marriage. It's not the only purpose, but the immediate cause that Jesus pointed to is the reason that God created it. And you see, if, if friendship is the purpose of marriage, that's going to have massive implications for dating. Because if marriage is about friendship, friendship ought to be the basis of dating. You ought to be looking for someone who is your equal, somebody who can be your friend, somebody with whom you can share your deepest commitments, which is why I say, if you're not a Christian, why the Bible says, you should never date or marry somebody who's not a Christian. You see, for a marriage really to work, for it to be life-giving and, and, and sustaining, you have to open up and share the deepest parts of yourself if it's gonna be fulfilling. If you're committed to Jesus and that's important to you and your partner is not, then when you open up this part of your life to them, they're not gonna understand it, right? And you're gonna feel violated because they don't share that thing that is deepest in your heart. I think of life, I've heard it said, like rowing a boat. If you got people on opposite sides of the boat that are trying to row in two different directions, um, that's what it's like to, to marry somebody who doesn't share your faith in Christ. If it's important to you, you're gonna constantly, they're gonna constantly misunderstand you. You're gonna, uh, when it comes to raising kids or when it comes to doing stuff with money and your future, or when it comes to priorities in your life, you're gonna be pulling in two different directions. Friendship is God's purpose for marriage. And that's gonna have massive implications for dating. It's also gonna have implications for singleness because what Jesus is gonna, is gonna do is he's gonna point to a union between members of his body that's stronger even than marriage, a family that is more significant even than our biological families are. One of the most important questions in life is this, what exactly is the gospel? Is it a set of rules to follow, a lifestyle to uphold? This is something we have to get right. Scripture tells us that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Religion keeps telling us that we need extra layers, but, but that's just not true. Religion says be and, and do it a certain way to be accepted, but, but that's not true either. The truth is that you are loved so deeply and accepted so fully in Christ that all you should be experiencing in Him is freedom. Freedom from yourself, freedom from your sin, and freedom from the pressure to do or to act a certain way to, to earn anything. This is the good news of the gospel, a relationship with God. And this, this truth is what we hope that you will embrace and enjoy for the rest of your life and your eternity. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in scripture, we'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. 
This resource aims at taking a dedicated one month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. So number two, number two, we see that the purpose for friendship is marriage. Number three, Jesus explains that the pattern for marriage is the gospel. The pattern for marriage is the gospel. This might be the biggest idea of them all and something Jesus only alludes to here. In Ephesians 5, Paul is gonna quote the same passage as Jesus does. And he's gonna explain that in that first marriage, God is giving us a picture of his love for his people. Now, again, Jesus only alludes to it here, but this is a huge idea. God designed marriage, Paul says, and everything that goes with it to give us a taste of his love. Not only is that going to give you a pattern for how you can love your spouse, but ironically, it's gonna show you how you can be happy and fulfilled in a season when you're not married, even when you really wanna be. How you can be content in a marriage that you're disappointed in. How you can be happy in an unhappy marriage. C.S. Lewis whom I obviously quote here a lot. Um, he, uh, he didn't get married till very much later in life, and I think he was in his mid-50s. He compared the blessing of marriage to a ray of sunshine. He said, um, he said, you know, when the sun, when you walk out in the morning and a ray of sunshine hits your face and it warms your face, he says, you look back up along the ray to the sun from which it emanates. He said, the sun is the actual source. The ray is just the, the manifestation of it. Ray is like a, uh, I mean, um, marriage is like a, a ray of the sunshine of God's beauty and his love. And if something in life obscures you from that ray, if a cloud um, comes between you and that ray, well, you're still in the presence of the sun, even though the ray's not shining on your face, the sun from which it emanates is still something that is a part of your life. Well, right before I got married, the first time that I went out with Veronica, I, I went into my class the next morning, seminary class, and one of my friends who knew what and had gone out with Veronica the night before was like, well, what'd you, you, know, what'd you think? And so I whipped out of my um, uh, notebook a piece of paper, and I just wrote down every adjective that I could think that described her. It was like 60-some different adjectives. And I put it on his deck. I said, that's what I think about her. And uh, then just, you know, he was like, I think he looked at it for maybe two seconds and handed it back and uh, meant more to me than, than to him, obviously. So, um, I, but I kept it in my notebook and by the grace of God, you know, kept that notebook. Um, and then years or a couple years later, when we got, um, when we got engaged, I was like, I wonder if I still have that notebook. Went back, found that list, got it framed. Uh, and then on our wedding day, gave that to her. Um, and it had a little statement under it by C.S. Lewis that basically was, you represent something that can never be taken away from me. And what I meant was, yes, there are situations where Veronica could be taken away from me. You know, death could come to one of us um, and she might not be a part of my life, but she represents something, the beauty that I experienced through her, the love, the, the tenderness. Those are things that emanate from the sunshine of God's love that can never be taken away. And if some dark cloud were to obscure the ray, the sun of God's love remains. By the way, I hope that you'll start learning to look at all of the blessings of life that way. Um, the, 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 the attention, the tenderness I felt for my parents, that was a, a stand-in for God's love. And so if your parents disappoint you, well, the ray's gone, but the sun remains. Um, the, the, the affirmation sometimes, the community that I feel from friends, those things are all manifestations of the goodness of God and experiencing them. I'm learning to experience goodness that comes from him. Um, the sunshine, the, the sun itself, is God's love and his presence. One of the rays, one of the manifestations is marriage. And it's a great one. But C.S. Lewis said, and the Bible tells you, don't get fixated on the ray because of the sun um, is what's important. So those are the three things that Jesus teaches us about marriage. He teaches us just in those few short statements that the essence of the marriage, um, the essence of marriage is the covenant. The purpose for marriage is friendship. And the pattern for marriage is the gospel. Now let's look at how Jesus uses those concepts to spell out what he's going to say is an obvious answer to the, to the divorce question. All right, what does Jesus teaching on marriage mean for divorce? Verse six, verse six, therefore, what God has joined together, well, no man ought to separate. 
Notice there, you got there at the end there? Nope, right, just period. No comma, no, no, no fine prints, no recommended reading, period. End of sentence. If marriage is a covenant instituted by God to demonstrate his love, if marriage really is a fusion of two souls into one, he's saying divorce should never be an option. Ah, verse seven. They said to him, whoa, wait a minute, Jesus. Why then did Moses, who was speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, why did Moses then command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? At that point, if you're writing the score for this scene, you cue the dramatic music, because that was true. Moses had said in Deuteronomy 24, one, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if he finds any indecency in her, then, well, he could divorce her. And they're like, well, wait a minute, Jesus, you're saying we shouldn't get divorced, but Moses clearly says we could. In fact, they use the word command. He commands us to, gotcha, Jesus. By the way, for the record, let's go ahead and say it. You should never get in a battle of wits with Jesus, particularly over the Bible. But the Pharisees were not always the spiciest Doritos in the bag, so they did. And Jesus looks back at them very calmly and says, okay, it's because of the hardness of your heart. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. He didn't command you. He allowed it. But from the beginning, according to God's original design, it was not so. Rabbis in Jesus' day taught a distinction listen to this, between a command in the law and a concession from the law. The command, they said, expressed God's heart. The command reveals God's desires and his plans from the beginning. A concession was something that God allowed in society because of the fallenness of man, because we're broken people, in order to keep peace in a society that are filled with, with different ones of us at various levels of spiritual maturity. This allowance for divorce, Jesus said, it was never a command, and you know that, he tells the Pharisees. It was not a command that expressed God's heart. It was a concession due to our fallen state. And the Pharisees knew that. Many of the rabbis at the time taught the difference in a command and concession of the law. That wasn't something new with Jesus. But here was their trap. What did Moses mean by something indecent? In Deuteronomy 24, he said you could get divorced and technically not be in sin if it was because of something indecent. In Hebrew, the phrase for something indecent is erwat dabar. And it was an ambiguous phrase, even for people who were fluent in Hebrew. What qualifies as erwat dabar? And there were two dominant schools of thought. The first was represented by a very popular rabbi around that time named Rabbi Shammai. And he said in that context, indecent, something indecent means only sexual indecency meaning that Moses allows divorce only in cases where some sexual indecency has occurred. This was the very conservative position. All the Southern Baptists would have been on, on this one. This is what they, we would have believed. On the other side, you had Rabbi Hillel. Hillel was the progressive thinker, the progressive rabbi. He, he lived over in Chapel Hill and he drove a Prius. Hillel said indecent means anything that you don't like about her. Maybe she was has indecent behavior by talking too much at parties. Maybe she has indecent cooking skills. Maybe she has indecent morning breath. I'm actually not exaggerating the, uh, this. We have a record of Rabbi Hillel saying, if she consistently burns the bread or what the bar, right? You may divorce her. Here's the thing. Most of the Jewish world was on the side of Rabbi Hillel, who was the more progressive thinker. So the Pharisees are trying to get Jesus on record saying something about marriage and divorce that would make him really unpopular. So what does Jesus answer? How does he respond to this? Verse nine, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Jesus actually comes out stronger than the conservative position. Not only should you not get divorced, he says, if you marry somebody else after leaving your first spouse, you are living in adultery with the second person because in God's eyes, that first covenant is still active. Because see, marriage is not a contract where you agree to a set of conditions so long as the other party satisfactorily fulfills theirs. Marriage is a covenant, he said, where you leave and cleave. You covenant, you pledge complete, unconditional, sacrificial love that mirrors God's love for us. What God has joined together, he says, nobody should separate. There were two understandings of marriage in that day, just like there are two in ours. I call one a consumer understanding and the other a covenant understanding. A consumer relationship is a relationship where you contract with somebody to, to meet a need. And just so you know, there's nothing wrong with consumer relationships in the right context. I have a consumer relationship with my grocery store. I go to my grocery store because it is convenient to my house, it has fairly good prices, and they carry those white 
chocolate-covered Oreos that I love. But if I find another grocery store that is more convenient, if it's got better prices on those Oreos, well, then, then I go there. It's not a huge deal. I don't have to meet with the owners of the store and, and break up with them and have a really tearful, it, none of that has to happen. It's a consumer relationship and there's nothing wrong with a consumer relationship in that context. But see, I, I can't have that kind of relationship with one of my children. I don't go up to one of my children and say, you know, you know, Raya, just things have really changed for me and it's just, just not working out anymore. It's not you, it's me. Well, God certainly has a lot to say to us about our, our most important relationships, doesn't he? I'd like to close our time with a, with a word of prayer. Will you join me? Father, I pray that these truths from your word, that your word would not come back void, that these truths would accomplish the purposes for which you've sent them to make the soul alive and to show us the way of life and how to exude your love in the lives of those that we care about the most. We pray and ask that, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. What exactly is the gospel? Is it a set of rules to follow? A lifestyle to uphold? This is something we have to get right. Scripture tells us that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. Religion keeps telling us that we need extra layers, but, but that's just not true. Religion says be and, and do it a certain way to be accepted, but, but that's not true either. The truth is that you are loved so deeply and accepted so fully in Christ that all you should be experiencing in Him is freedom. Freedom from yourself, freedom from your sin, and freedom from the pressure to do or to act a certain way to, to earn anything. This is the good news of the gospel, a relationship with God. And this, this truth is what we hope that you will embrace and enjoy for the rest of your life and your eternity. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in scripture, we'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? a 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool so enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. God calls himself a divorced person. Which means if you're the kind of person that just feels like you're too good, you don't want anything to do with divorced people, you feel like you and your family are too good for them, right? Or you don't want your son marrying or daughter marrying somebody that comes from divorced parents, you're in the unenviable position of feeling like you are too good for God, which is not a place you wanna be. Thanks for joining us today on Summit Life. You can visit us at jdgreer.com. You'll find resources, transcripts, and all of our teaching available free of charge. We'll see you next time for Summit Life with J.D. Greer. Today's program was produced and sponsored by J.D. Greer Ministries.